forward. I wanted to read to you this morning out of uh, Leviticus chapter 23. I found out yesterday that today was the day of Pentecost. I didn't even realize that. And, you know, I feel like there's always that, that when it comes to preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that really and truly, because we're a Pentecostal church, we should always take the opportunities and the time to teach and to preach. I've prayed a lot about this through the years. And so today is the day of Pentecost, and we're going to learn a little bit about it. But uh, I want to tell you that all those songs that we sang, I'm just saying, when you're going to raise a hallelujah. And then one of them songs that said, let your fire fall, right? And, and I don't remember exactly what it said, but let your fire fall has something to do with my pain going away. And it has something to do with joy or all my, fears. Yeah, all my fears. Because, see, the fire is representative of the Holy Spirit. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that the more of the Holy Spirit that you have in your life, the better your life is going to be. I don't want you to sit here and think that if you ever, when, when in, not, not if, when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're desiring to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you got to want it. The Holy, Spirit's, the Holy Spirit's not going to overwhelm you and give you something that you're not wanting, okay? But if, and I'm sorry, when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, I got to tell you that the spirit of fear is still going to try to jump on you at times. I got to tell you that frustration will still try to jump on you at times. I got to tell you that temptation will still try to overwhelm you at times and hopelessness and frustration and aggravation and, and all of these other things. But look, I got to tell you something, that the more of the Holy Spirit you have in your life, the better off you're going to be. Amen? I mean, you are a child of God now, right? You are like the thief. You did throw up a hallelujah, and you did receive your Messiah as your Lord and Savior. And see, when you did that, the Bible teaches, you just got to trust me on this, that the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of your heart. Now, I don't know about you, because I didn't even know what I was praying back in the day. When I, listen, I went to, when I got saved in Twin City Gospel, they was talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Every service. They, they didn't understand the finished work of Christ and how to gain victory through faith in the, in the finished work of Christ and how grace flows in your life and the Holy Spirit goes to work for you in that way because he's the dispenser of grace. They didn't understand all that. What they did understand is that Jesus died on the cross to, set, to, to break the, the chain of sin so that you could be saved and that you need the Holy Spirit in your life. That's what they knew. That's what they preached. And look, man, you walk into that church and people running around with tambourines and they was on fire for the... But guess what? People were still struggling in their heart and in their lives. And to some extent, we always will because we live on a fallen earth. I hope that that makes a little bit of sense. But look, there's a purpose for that infilling. There's a purpose for that infilling. You know, I go back to Sister Toot because that was her church. You know the amazing thing about her story? Look, I can't even do it justice. I was driving down the road one day, and I just, my, thinking about her, thinking about this old woman that I got saved. I wish y'all could have met her. Some of y'all might have known her, but, but I wish you could have. I wish you could have met this woman uh, in her, like, I can only imagine what she must have been like in her prime. She, had a, she, was a, she was a tall woman, and she was so full of confidence in the boldness of the Holy Spirit. Yet she still had her fears because one man stole the church from her, and she was fearful that another man would steal another church is how she looked at it. But I'll tell you something, like back in the, I could be wrong on the dates, but I'm thinking the 1940s maybe. There was no men preachers around here. You got to understand. No, she was it, my friend. When the Brown Derby was kicking down there on River Road, or not River, is that what it is? River Road, over there by the, uh, off the river in, in Berwick, right there downtown. Y'all know what I'm talking about? When the Brown Derby and all that stuff was kicking, when, when Morgan City was that transient town, and, and it was all, like, they had bar rooms over there, probably brothels. I don't know what all they had. This woman was out there with one of them little, not a, not a, uh, they, I don't think they had the electric bullhorns yet, but she was out there with one of them megaphones preaching Jesus in the streets because and listen people are like well what does she know you, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and when you get filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit you will have the boldness and the confidence to do what God has called you to do and that's really what the infilling is all about there were no men doing it she was out there doing it preaching up and down those streets telling them to repent for the kingdom of God is near and listen to me people got saved 
saved and people got filled with the Holy Spirit. No, it gets even, I can't even begin to list to you the men of God or, you know, you can call it, you can say whatever you want. Yeah, but it was a bunch of false, doc- okay, whatever. Men that got saved and went into ministry. Lee Lamry that started Living Word got saved in that ministry. Um, but that's just, I wish I could do the justice. I can't even think of them right now. All of the men of God that ended up getting saved out of that, and that's what I was doing as I was driving down the road and tears were flowing down my eyes because guess what? It looked, it looked irrelevant to the natural eye. It looked like, look at this woman. She's, she's crazy. What, what is she doing? But guess what? God showed up and did a work in her and he did a work through her and she believed a simple message. Amen. And God moved. And so this morning, I want to tell you that God has called us to a specific thing in this church. I mean, God has made it very clear to my heart, and I try the best I can to communicate it to the people that are faithful coming to the church so that you understand. Because see, if you view what we're doing here and you look at the rest of the church world or other things that are going on, it may look different. And sometimes it might look insignificant because what are you saying? Because we got a lot of empty chairs. I'm not ashamed to say it anymore. I used to, I used to be, listen, what I want you to know is, is that there is something going on in the church world that is different than what the Bible tells us is supposed to be done. I'm not trying to say that that's why our church, our church isn't filled to the gills because we're doing it right and everybody else is doing it wrong. No, I'm not. No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am trying to say is this, is that the Lord has called us to make disciples. The Lord has spoken directly to my heart and shown me, son, I've called you to do some things. And part of what the Lord has called me to do, okay, is to sow seed of the gospel. What does that mean? Throw it out there. Everywhere I go, any time of the day, whenever the opportunity arises, I'm going to bring Jesus with me and I'm going to let others know about his name because he needs to be exalted above all other gods upon the face of this earth. He is worthy of of, of glory and praise. Amen. And then the other thing is to teach people the word of God so that they themselves can get to know this Jesus that has changed my heart and my life. Now, as the Lord does that for you, because see, you, any of you, like I'm looking at all you people here. I see all these faces. We really don't have any new visitors today, but all you people here have been here enough to know that there's a lot of information that comes out of this pulpit, maybe somewhat, sometimes too much, but anybody that has sat in services for any length of time can admit that they've at least learned some things. Now, what I need you to understand is that part of the process is that as you learn, the reason that you're learning, do you understand there's a purpose of your learning? Yeah, you, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not just coming here to learn about Jesus just so that you can learn about Jesus. No. If we look at the grand scheme of the plan of God, that you're learning about Jesus so that you can help somebody else learn about Jesus. Does that make sense? And the hope is, is that as you either invite people here or new people do show up and they get saved and then you build relationships with them in some kind of way, hopefully, in some way there's some kind of connection guess what they come man that preacher was talking about about the feast of weeks and i don't even know what what does the loaf of bread have to do with the feast of weeks? what in the world what is he talking about i don't even understand that well guess what the hope and the prayer is is that some of you that have been learning amen through the and doing your own study also amen and learning guess what you're now able to 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 teach to teach them, to encourage these people at a level that they might be able to understand better. Amen? Um, We're not going backwards. We're going forward. Amen? In the things of God. And people that hang around for any length of time are going to learn some things. And even if the Lord calls somebody else somewhere else, I've come to that conclusion. It's okay. You're his people. And I know what he's called me to do, so I just need to do what he's called me to do. And if it helps God's people in any way, shape, or form to understand him better, to grow in him, then then I've accomplished what he's asking me to do and he's asking us to do corporately as we come together. So I hope that makes some sense. Amen? All right. 
Let's read about this Feast of Weeks out of Leviticus chapter 23. This is also known as the Feast of Pentecost, okay? And the reason that it's called the Feast of Weeks, you'll see as we read, because it talks about seven full weeks. So we're reading. Now, this is, let me give you a little bit of time frame here, chrono- chronologically speaking, so that you can understand. God's got a plan, and, and I love to understand the timeline because it helps me to see where we are in the big picture of God. See, that's why I like maps. That's why I like timelines. I know that it's boring to some people, but the better you understand it, the better you understand the Bible. So where we are right here is the fall has taken place, obviously. The flood has taken place. The Tower of Babel has taken place. So when God confused their languages, the people groups spread all over the world. God is called Abraham. God through Abraham has created a people group. The people group that were slaves in Egypt. The Passover has happened, right? The people were delivered out of Egypt just like you were delivered out of the world. They were delivered out of Egypt through the shedding of the blood of a lamb just like you were delivered out of the world through the shedding of the blood of a lamb. His name was Jesus. This isn't accidental. God's doing it this way on purpose so that we can see how real he is. So they've come out of the Passover. They've crossed through the Red Sea and they're they're still wandering. And God is telling them, see, they're wandering in a wilderness just like Christian just like you just like me we give our hearts to the Lord we we get a glimpse of the glory of God we we embrace the that bloody lamb that died for us on the cross we get saved the Holy Spirit comes to comes to live in our heart we might even be filled with the Holy Spirit my friend and guess what we can still wander in a wilderness because we're still not satisfied completely with God. We long for the things of the world. Because like the old preacher or somebody said one time, it only took him one day to get Israel out of, out of Egypt, but it took him 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. How long will it take the Lord to get the world out of us? Uh, it's going to take longer if we don't surrender to him. It's going to take longer if we don't let him have his way in our hearts. It's going to take longer if we still allow those other gods to be exalted above our God. You know, whatever those gods are is what I'm trying to say. Whatever those things are in our lives that try to prevent us from going towards the Lord, you know, and so now he's about to bring them into the promised land, and he says to them, these feasts, real quick, he's talking about these feasts, and we're about to get the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, but I want you to understand that in this chapter, I'm not going back to read the whole thing, there were three other feasts before this. There was Passover, the first Passover, all right? Y'all remember what Passover was? The killing of the lamb, collecting its blood, painting it on their doorposts and their side posts. It said when judgment passes through, he said the death angel. When the death angel passes through and I see the blood, what did he say? I will pass over you. See, when when you get saved, New Testament talk, right? Time frame, what what is this? Is about 1450 B.C., something like that. 1450 years before Jesus is ever born, okay? Whenever you get saved, the Lord sees the blood on your heart. Amen. And and guess what? Judgment now does not have to come to your home. Correction, yes. Chastisement, yes. Conviction, yes. Judgment, no. Your judgment for your sin was placed on Jesus. So that's Passover. Then that Passover started a week of a, fe- a feast called unleavened bread. Leaven is is yeast. The Bible is very clear that yeast in the Bible, leaven in the Bible, is representative of sin. See, Jesus had no sin. So these feasts, 1,450 years before Jesus was ever born, are representative of Jesus and his work. So Passover is representative of his work on the cross when he died as the lamb. The unleavened bread is representative of his sinless life that was given by the Father for us and then the Feast of first fruits. We have already talked about that many a time but, but in, in passing, but let me explain that again. The Feast of first fruits was the first Sunday, according to our understanding, the day after the Sabbath. The first Sunday after the Passover. It, it doesn't get any better than this, my friend. you got to understand, this is some kind of deep stuff, not for some people in here, but this is, this is pretty profound. That God would institute festivals... 1,450 years or so before Jesus Christ, and that the first one would be the Passover. And Paul said that Jesus is our Passover, for he was crucified for us. That he would be the sinless one of unleavened bread. And that 
on the Feast of First Fruits, which was the first Sunday after the Passover, they would take a sheaf of grain, which is kind of like a bundle of grain, and they would wave it in the air. On that first Feast of First Fruits was the feast. On that day, 1,450 years or whatever later, Jesus rose from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you see the picture of what's happening? This is powerful. It might be hard for us to wrap our brain around it, but this is amazing <laughs> that God, 1,450 years beforehand, prepared all this in advance. Every year he told his children, you will come to Jerusalem or you will come to meet with me. Okay, and you will celebrate, you will observe the Passover, and there's a whole lot that could be said. And you will observe the week of unleavened bread, and you will observe the feast of first fruits on the first Sunday after the Passover. And then from that day, you will start counting 50 days. Pinty, fit five. You will start counting 50 days from the day of the feast of first fruits, and then you will celebrate the feast of weeks. Or the Feast of Pentecost. Now hold on a second. Because see, in the New Testament, this is again 1,450. I know y'all getting tired of me saying that, but I don't, I don't feel like y'all are getting it. <laughs> Either that or y'all are thinking hard. Okay, and that's cool. All right. In this 1,450 years before Jesus, the Feast of first fruits, and then they started counting 50 days. Okay? Fast forward 1,450 years. Jesus dies as the Passover lamb. During that week of unleavened bread, he resurrects on the Feast of first fruits on the first Sunday after the Passover. And then 50 days later, the Holy Spirit descends in the upper room. You get the picture? This is all written out 1,450 years before Jesus ever. Had. Listen, God is so good. He wants you to be able to see that he was already had this thing whole planned out. And if he had all of this planned out, what can he not do for your life? The problem that you and I run into is we get ahead of ourselves. We can't, we have a difficult time waiting on the timing of the Lord. I'm talking, listen, I'm talking to you about something that I know. <laughs> that we take matters into our own hands and we manipulate situations and circumstances. And listen, the reason why we do some of that is because that's what daddy told me to do, right? I mean, come on, going up all my life, he's like, boy, you better take the bull by the horns. You better pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And then and, and don't, don't listen to my daddy's advice on this. He said, if he looks squarely, punch him first. <laughs> you know, no, you can't take matters into your own hands, right? Not when it comes to spiritual things. We have to learn to start doing things a little, we have to start learning how to do things God's way, to surrender to him, amen, and to learn his ways. All right, let's read. Here we go. This is the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Pentecost. He says, you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath. Now, check that out. What is, what is seven full weeks? How many days would that be? 49. That's right. Now, I didn't even put this in my notes, but as I was looking this morning, I thought this was very interesting. If you don't, I probably shouldn't even do this, but guess what? Every week was a, was a consider, the number seven is a number of completion with God, right? He, he created for six days, then on the seventh day he rested. You reckon God was tired? You get tired. I know you do because I get tired. Can I tell you God don't get tired? <laughs> God, God never sleeps. The God of Israel doesn't sleep, the Bible says. No, because, see, the work was completed. So, therefore, he rested because he was showing us that when he does something, he finishes the job, amen? That's a good little plug for your work ethic, for my work ethic. When God does something, when he starts something, he finishes it. He don't drag up halfway through. He gets it done, amen? And that's what I want you to see in this number seven. And so there was all kind of laws having to do with the seventh day, and there was a Sabbath on the seventh day, and then there was a seven-year period. Some people call it the Shemitah, okay, because you were supposed to leave the, the ground uh, without being tilled for the whole year to trust God that he was going to provide for you in that seventh year. But then when you took seven sevens, then you ended up with a 49-year period, and that 49th through the 50th was the year of Jubilee. And there was all kind of beautiful things that happened, freedom and being released. If you had been in slavery because you lost all your money, God, you got to reset. Amen? And, and so all these beautiful things. But look, here's another one. Seven full weeks. All right? Seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf 
of the wave offering. That was for the Feast of First Fruits. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord. With their grain offering and their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of peace offerings. Then the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord. With the two lambs, they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edges, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Now there's a couple of things that I wanted you to see. Uh, I, I forgot to, I was supposed to give you this first. So this is, this is the title of my message, okay? It's fire for the family. I don't know if that's going to make sense when it's all said and done, but I think it does. It has a lot of sense to it. It's fire for the family. Because, and the reason I'm talking about that is because we're talking about the Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. And we were going to look at these scriptures, so I just read this. But look, what I want you to get out of Leviticus, I know there, there was a lot of information there. I want you to understand, first of all, the time frame. Pentecost takes place 50 days after the resurrection for the church. In the Old Testament, Pentecost took place 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits in the Old Testament. So I just wanted you to kind of have a little bit of understanding. But one of the main things I wanted to stick out in your mind, and I'm going to kind of preach this a little bit as we move forward, is those two loaves of bread. I wanted you to see that, because, and why? Because, see, it's harvest time. Does that make sense? Because, see, God is all about a harvest. I got to tell you, this is not accidental. God was speaking about things about harvest in the Old Testament. Then when we go to the New Testament, he shifts years he still uses the harvest theme but now he's talking about the harvest of humanity does that make sense that you're part you're going to be part of the harvest do you understand that when we talk about the seed you remember the parable of the sower a sower went out to sow and he some of the seed was along the wayside some of the seed fell amongst thorny ground some of the seed fell amongst thorn he goes back and he interprets the parable and what does he say the seed is the word of God. The word of God on the inside of your heart is the kingdom of God that is planted in you when you hear the good news of the gospel and you receive that seed unto yourself. It's like the seed of the kingdom, the seed of the gospel is planted in your heart. And now sometimes it takes a little while to germinate. Sometimes it takes a little while for the root to get down there, right? But the plan of God is, is that that seed will be protected. There goes the whole parable of the sower. That's why you're not... You know, look, you got to move them rocks out the way because it'll prevent the root. If anything's in your life that's like a rock that's trying to prevent you from growing in Christ, get, get, go, go, go back in your field and get all them rocks out the field so that the seed of the kingdom's root can go down into the soil so that you can receive some hydration or some watering to your seed as the Holy Spirit speaks to you. If there's thorns of life, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, if that's getting in the way of the kingdom's seed, Understand it and say, Lord, take it away, right? So the seed is the kingdom. And look, in the end, God's going to have a harvest. So I want you to see that. There's a harvest. But look, the bread. I want you to see the bread. Why? Because what is bread? I mean, I know that I'm, maybe I think too deep, but I'm going to give you some New Testament thought on this before we're done. What is bread? Okay, it's hard for you and I to understand this, right? Because what do we do? We go to the store, and what do we do? I don't know if y'all do this, but back in Lafayette, when I was a kid growing up, we had an Evangeline made bread factory over there. And I remember when mom, well, you, could, you could smell it when you drive down Cameron Street. You could smell that Evangeline made bread. It's like, oh my gosh, that stuff smells so good. And I can remember whenever we'd walk through the aisle, 
mama would squeeze the loaf of Evangeline bread a little bit. I'm like, what you doing? I'm seeing how fresh it is, boy. And so I was like, I started like, I, I would walk behind her. She didn't even know it. And I kind of like squeeze a little bit. Hopefully I never like, like really squeeze it. I probably did though. But you know, like squeeze a little bit and see how soft it was. Right. But so it's hard for you and I to wrap our mind around that because we just go to the store and buy a loaf of bread. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that in the context of harvest, if you and I really understood, because there's so much harvest imagery in the Bible. Like, you got to go out there and you got to cut down the grain. Now, we got combines now, my friend. You can see all these sugar cane combines on the side of the road. Life is easy. Back then, they had a sickle. And they go over there, and they had to harvest that grain. Then they'd have to thresh it out. They had a big old millstone. They'd tie it to the ox, and them ox would just walk in a circle and just grind all that grain to remove the husk from it. Then what would they do? They'd put it on the threshing floor. You remember all the parable stories that Jesus talks about, about the threshing floor? And then they'd take that winnowing fork, and they'd stick it in that pile of grain, and they'd lift it up, and the wind would carry the chaff away, and the grain would fall back down that it could be kept in the storage and in that parable you're the grain and the chaff is the people that are not of the lord and the things in your life amen too that 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 god that god wants to get rid of but but i want you to know that that seed time and harvest but look what's the end result then they take that grain and they might go grab one of them hens chick eggs right and they crack that egg up in that flour that coarse flour because it's not refined and bleached like ours. And they crack that egg in there. It might pour a little bit of goat milk in there. I don't know how you make bread. I'm just saying either some goat milk or some water, maybe a little bit of water in an egg. And then what do they do? They start stirring it up, right? I'll throw a little leaven in there so it'll rise or, or not. And you have unleavened bread. And then what they do, they shape it, they mold it, and they stick it in the oven. And then what happens? You got two loaves of bread. So I said all of that to make the point that in the story, in Leviticus, that the first time for the Feast of First Fruits, they, wo- they waved the sheaf in the air. But then 50 days later, they took probably the same grain from that sheaf. They ground it up. They mixed it up with a hen's egg. And then, they, and then they put some water in it. And they molded it together. And they stuck it in the oven. And then out comes... Two loaves of bread because, you see, it's a completed work. God's always about completed work. And so those two loaves of bread show us fulfillment and completion of the harvest, that the harvest has come in and God's will was done. Listen, I know there's a lot of typology in that, but I need you to to see that. So that was Leviticus. Now, now let's go ahead and take a look. We're going to go to Acts chapter 1. We're going to read some there. Then we're going to go to Acts chapter 2. All right, so we're fast-forwarding into the New Testament, and we're trying to uh, see the, um, we're trying to see the, the, the comparisons of how Pentecost looks in the New Testament to what it looked like in the Old Testament, right? So let's just go ahead and start in verse 1. It says, in the first book, this is Luke writing. Y'all know that Luke wrote the book of Acts, and he's writing a letter to some guy named Theophilus, all right? That's what the book of Acts is all about. I know you get lost in the story of all the things happening, but you got to understand it was a letter written by Dr. Luke to a man named Theophilus. And he says, in the first book, what's he talking about? When I wrote you the gospel of Luke, that has my name when I wrote you that letter. In the first book, that's what I was talking about. In this book, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands Through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. Appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. See, this is what Jesus does for his disciples. He's like, you got to stay focused, my friend. Chris, Shelby, I know, Wade, look, I know y'all are busy. This world is busy. You got to stay focused. Because see, now you're part of the kingdom. And as you're part of the kingdom, there's work that we're doing. So listen, stay focused. And he's speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them, don't depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons 
that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That doesn't mean that God does not want us digging into the scriptures to try to figure out end time events like Rick Warren says. That's not what God's saying right here. What he's saying is, you got enough to worry about today, my friend. You don't have to worry about exactly when I'm coming back and you get all caught up in that. You need to be ready today and you need to do the work of the kingdom today. All right? He says, the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so now the question is, why do we need this power, church? Well, look, so you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, I want to just stop for a second and I want to say, when it comes to our Baptist friends, and look, the Baptists teach a lot of really good doctrinal stuff when it comes to justification by faith and things like that. But they don't not believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then we have people in Pentecost that don't even know what they believe about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's just reality, my friend. And I'm not going to get into all the nitty-gritty details because I have a tendency to over-explain things. But what I do want you to know is, is that the purpose of the power is so that you and I could be witnesses for the Lord. Now, I will make this comment. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is about having more of the Holy Spirit simplified, right? What that means is, is that anytime you have more of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have more of the, of the attributes of the Spirit of God moving and operating in your life. That means you're going to feel more conviction. That means you're going to feel more grace. That means you're going you're gonna to feel like you want to do the will of God more than you want to do your own will. The more of the Holy Spirit you have, the more you're going to think like God. Amen? But the main purpose of the Holy Spirit in this case, is to give you and I power to be witnesses. Now, many ways that people shoo this concept away is they say, yeah, but that was for then. See, he was talking to his disciples. So my question to you is, is the work of God done on earth? It, no, it's not even close to being done. Well, it might be close to being done, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done, right? So I can tell you right now, God still wants you and he still wants me filled with the Holy Spirit. And when it's all said and done, I'm going to ask Shelby and the musicians to come back up here and sing some kind of song, one or two songs. I'm a, you, if you want to come up here and let me pray for you, I think that's a great idea to humble yourself and to ask the Lord. But really what I want you to do is if you can just hang out a little bit while we sing a couple of songs to Jesus. Okay, I want you to know that when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, it was when I had my focus on Jesus. When I was thinking about him. Yes, I know Dustin came through here. I know some people got filled with the Holy Spirit that day. I know they did. Okay, and, and, and praise God. Thank God for Dustin. I mean, for the ministry that God uses him in. And we're going to bring him back in again. Okay, and if you, and something happened that, you didn't, that it didn't happen the way you wanted it to and you got frustrated, Dustin called me up one day about three days later. He's like, Matt, I don't know if everybody got healed, but just let them know that it's not them. They're not the fault, and it's not God. It's me. I'm just a weak man. I'm like, Dustin, these people know that. They ain't looking to you, okay? They're they looking to the Jesus that you promote, amen? And so, so it doesn't always go our way, but what I want you to know is, is that when you get filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing, see, the Holy Holy Spirit, Jesus even said it. He said, the, the, I will pray to the Father and he will send another comforter. And the spirit of truth, whom the, the world doesn't know him. You know him, but, but you, he will be in you. And, and the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the spirit of truth, he will take of what is mine. Jesus is saying he's going to take my work and he's going to show it to you. See, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to help you and I to see Jesus more clearly. And the ministry of, the, of more of the Holy Spirit is so that you and I can take the Jesus that's in us when we got saved and give it to somebody else. Amen? Because there's a great harvest, you see. And the gospel is like a seed. And the Lord is wanting a sower of seed to plant seed and, and waterers of seed to come behind because he said, some sow, some water. I am the Lord of the harvest. Amen? So God's got a harvest, and I want you to see that. Pentecost was a harvest feast, and I wanted you to see all of these things. All right, now let's go ahead and go to Acts chapter 2. Whenever they're all in the upper room, uh, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1, and it says right here, when the day of Pentecost arrived, so again, remember, this is about, I kept saying 1,450, it's at least 1,483.5 years later than the, than the feast we talked about. Why? Because Jesus is 
about, you know, 33 at this time. When the day of Pentecost arrived, well, Jesus is already in heaven, sorry. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. That's a beautiful thing, by the way, to how the people of God are in the house of God. They're all in communion. I don't know if you've been reading your book or not, but we're going to have our first little Bible study class June 12th. I'm excited about that because I've just been thinking about fellowshipping with the saints, talking about the Bible, praying together. I hope you've been getting something out the book. Do you understand everything about the book? No, because guess what? I probably don't understand everything about the book, but we're going to learn together. Anyway, they were all in one place. They came together. That's why it's important to come to church, folks. Amen? We come to the house of the Lord to be together as we worship God together. All right? He said, they were all in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit Gave them utterance. Amen. It's the spirit that's going to give you the utterance, my friend. Well, what does that feel like? I don't know how to describe it other than what happened to me. And I've talked to other people and they say it's something similar. It's kind of like the way the Lord speaks to you. Have you ever had the Lord speak to you before? This is the best way I can describe how the Lord speaks. All I know is, is that it feels like it's coming from somewhere up in here. Yes, it filters from here through here some kind of way. But I know that when I hear the voice of the Lord, it's not a thought that I create that came into my head from a normal process of thinking. I know this is deep, but I'm just trying to make a point. Because, like, for instance, when I was in the barroom bathroom when the Lord spoke to me, I wasn't no more. Yes, I was thinking about God off and on that night because I was miserable, but I was no more thinking about this. This stuff just showed up out of nowhere when the Lord started speaking way down deep in my belly and said, listen to them. They need me. They all need me. And look at you. I can't even use you. Oh, you've been, always been willing to tell people about me, but only in a way where you could still look cool. No, you will lay your life down before me and you will present my word for the way that it is written. And then I will use you. Boom. So when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it's something kind of similar to that, I think. Uh, hopefully y'all agree that are filled with the Spirit when it happened to you that you could agree. That, it's a, that the voice is some, coming from somewhere down up in here. You know, Sister Toot, bless her soul, I told y'all this story before. I used to go up to the altar almost every time. Lord, fill me with your spirit. And she'd say, brother, because, you know, she probably got tired of seeing me gum up there because you're like, well, you either got it or you don't. I ain't looking for nothing fake, my friend. I want the real deal, right? And she'd say, brother, speak it out. And she grabbed the bottom of my jaw and trying to make my jaw come out. I ain't never going to do that to you because that is just weird, bro. <laughs> you know, I'm like, but this woman wasn't playing. She's like, come out of here, you know. And so it's not like I can't get some woman to grab my bottom jaw and I can't get her to start flapping my lips because it don't work like that. The Spirit gives me the utterance, but I want you to know the Holy Spirit is not going to move your lips. Yes, does that make sense? You're going to hear something deep down inside, and you're going to feel the Spirit of God moving on. And then you're going to speak it. You're going to speak what's in you. And when you start to speak it, sometimes it's just a little bit, and then sometimes it just flows out and it's a lot. You know, I tell you all the stories before because I want people to know. You know, I got... And listen, let me just use this story because this is important. We're talking about Pentecost today. Out of all that time, I just knew that I was filled with the Holy Spirit, but I would always question in the back of my head whether I was. And you know what everybody told me was? They said, oh, yeah, the devil's going to try to steal it from you, right? And, and, and there's probably truth to that. The devil's going to try to steal it from you. In other words, tell you that you didn't really get it. Okay, and so I would drive away from those church services, and I would be like, yeah, but they said that, because I would be like, I would question myself in my head and in my heart. I just don't really feel like I have it. But they're telling me I have it, and I'm young, and I'm impressionable. And they meant well. They weren't trying to mess me up. They were trying to help me. And they, but, and they would say, no, you got it. Don't, you got it, you know. Uh, so don't let the devil lie to you. But I always felt in my heart that I really maybe didn't. But I didn't know what to do. So anyway, I go through this long period of time, 12 years. I've told you all the story of struggling. And it, I don't know. I know I'm not trying to say it was because I wasn't truly filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm just telling you, in my flesh, I was wanting to do some stuff. And then the tragedy happened, right? I told you all the tragedy about my sister, right? And, and, you know, I wrote a poem. Tragedy, tragedy, my heart is now felt with a senseless death with no one's help. The only thing worse than the tragedy day is for after that day, the same I stay. 
And so there I am in all of this pain and heartache, but the Lord showed up in that barroom bathroom, and now I'm hungry for Jesus. I'm reading my Bible again. I'm listening to uh, Lauren Larson. You know, maybe maybe not quite yet, but, I, but at some point in time, I'll start listening to Lauren at lunchtime. And actually, this was probably before Lauren, and I can remember I started listening to some third day stuff. I might have been listening to The Thief. I don't know. But I had a big old dip in my lip. I can remember it. I had a dip in my lip, and I was sitting in the car, and I was singing. And listen, most of those songs that and you can think whatever you want about Mac Powell, there was a season in his life that brother was in tune with the Lord. And most of his songs that he wrote are like Jesus is singing the song, right? And and and, and or the thief in that case was singing the song. Whatever the song was, I just know I was thinking about Jesus, and I was into it, man. I had, and I'm singing, and I'm just worshiping the Lord. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there it is, bro. There it is. What what is this? What is this, right? Rising up, woo, and, and look, it just started flowing out. Never again did I ever question whether I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm just trying to tell truth to you. I want truth. I want the real thing. I'm trying to hear to communicate to you. You need it. You and I need the real thing. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because we want more of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And He's going to give us the strength that we need. So, am I trying to put pressure on you? No. Because listen, you know me. I'm like, hey, look, when it comes to altar call time. I'll put this in here because ain't nobody going to show up anyway. Listen, you don't have to come to the altar. I want you to come to the altar. I want to lay hands on you. I want to believe God with you. And guess what? I ain't going to feel the least bit weird if you walk out of here and you ain't speaking in tongues because it ain't me. I'm not the baptizer, my friend. Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. He will baptize you into the Holy And Jesus wants you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit because Jesus wants you to have more of the Holy Spirit because Jesus wants you to be given power. You see, the Baptists might not believe it and, and the Presbyterians might not believe it. And even though the Methodists believed in it when John Wesley was preaching, they might not believe it now. It ain't, it ain't gone today, gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen. You know why? Because the work isn't done. The work is not done. And so we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit gives you the utterance, what do you do? You let it out. Now there were dwelling. I want you to see what happened, though, because this is so interesting. Was the miracle in that they spoke a tongue, or was the miracle that the people around them heard the tongue? Now, I'm going to tell you that there's more to this baptism of the Holy Spirit than we even talk about in Pentecost. There's more to this baptism of the Holy Spirit than, than even the people that you love the most don't talk about a whole lot. I'm not saying they never talk about but I don't hear it. So I want you to know, was the miracle in that they even spoke in another tongue? Or was the miracle that the people heard them in their own language? Okay. This is an interesting thought, too, because I've always kind of gone back and forth. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know that I got the answer. But you know me. I'm always trying to figure stuff out. So what am I saying whenever I speak in tongues? I will tell you the Apostle Paul said, though I can speak with the language of men or the language of angels. I'm not trying to say that we're speaking in an angelic language. I thought this was interesting. One time me and Brad Bullock flew to Dallas for a, for a conference. And I got to watch this man named Stanley Horton teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Stanley, Dr. Horton was 92 years old when I went to that thing. Look, he, this guy was the, he got a, he had his degree from Harvard and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was the guy in the early stages of the movement of the Azusa Street Revival. If you never heard of the Azusa Street Revival, when you go home, you need to Google that. Google Azusa Street Revival. I think it's spelled A-Z-U-S-A. It was a street in California, in L.A. Beautiful story. Do we have time? Sure we do. There was a one-eyed black man from Centerville, Louisiana, named William J. Seymour. Right up the road, Centerville. Anybody live in Centerville? Give a little shout-out to Centerville. Hey, look, you come from a good place, girl. So Mr. William J. Seymour, now this is a time frame. We're probably talking like, no, this is 1901, my friend, 1906 maybe, okay? So he gets, I don't know how he traveled all the way to Houston, Texas, but he was en route to L.A. because he was given a position as a pastor in a church in L.A. So on his way through Houston, he stops at this conference that they had heard about, about a man named uh, Parham. Mr. Parham owned, had a Bible school up in Topeka, Kansas, I believe it was. And Mr. Parham had been going on trips, and he told the students, he said, listen, 
I know there's a second work of grace that takes place after salvation that gives power to God's people. I know it's there. I've seen it. I just, what is the evidence of it? Okay, so Parham says, listen, I'm going on a trip. I need, y'all just study. Let's find this out. There's something going on that we're missing, okay? So, so they start studying, and I think her name was, I don't know, I'm probably getting her confused. I was about to say Etta James, but I'm pretty sure that's a, a singer. <laughs> so, but her name might have been something James. She started seeing in the book of Acts when they began to speak with other tongues, and look, the Holy Spirit hit her. She began to speak. This, this thing went all over the globe. It was like fire, but the result of it was just not that people were just speaking in other tongues. I mean, come on, that by itself is kind of weird. No, but what happened was people started getting saved. People started getting saved and filled with the fire of God. More people were getting saved. More was being added to the church daily. You see, I got, I got a book back there that I read more than once that tells you the whole history of it. What's interesting to me was that there was another man in the midst of all of that. Because you see, the apostle Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian church, and he warned them. He said, you come behind no one in any gift. Talking about the gifts of the Spirit. In other words, yeah, one has a tongue. One has an interpretation of the tongue. You got all these gifts, but you know what he said? But you're carnal. He said, you can't even eat meat. You're a bunch of milk sippers. That's what Paul said. I, didn't, I mean, he might not have said it exactly like that, but it kind of looks like he did. You're still drinking milk. There's nobody producing fruit. You're all carnal in your gifts. So just because a church is full of gifts, don't think that that's automatically the best church. Because Corinth was full of gifts, but they had no fruit, okay? We need both, church. We need the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we need the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, there was a man that came through after the Azusa Street Revival took off. I'm kind of moving forward. I'm going to tell you the whole story. After it took off, this man shows up, and it's written. It's got him quoted. He said, when I saw the people. And all of their glorifying the gifts of the Holy Spirit. My heart was stricken in me. And I took the stage and said, why have you left Jesus in all of this doing? See, they had forgotten the Lord. I mean, that was his take on it. They had, in all of the gifts and the moving and operation, and this one given a word in tongues, and this one given an interpretation, and that one given a word of knowledge, and all of these things taking place, he said, I submitted to them Jesus, the Christ, for their consideration. One thing that we cannot do is we cannot go. See, that's where Pentecost went, my friend. When Pentecost went so far with the fire and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Even Brother Swaggart back in the day did not understand the sound doctrines of justification by faith. See, that's the beauty about Brother Swaggart's ministry. People may not understand it. Three things that I see. Number one, he was called by God as a young age, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit. You know that man's the first person that ever preached on Pentecost and spoke in tongues on TV? He is. Okay, and, and they told him he couldn't do it. And he said, oh, no, the Holy Spirit told me I can do it, and I'm going to do it. All right, so that, he was the first ever. And then, and then, but then secondly, he had the platform. So if you look at it like that, God had to bring that man through some things so that he could really understand victory in Christ because now we got a man that's, that was be filled with the Holy Spirit and has proper doctrine and has a platform through which he can tell the world about it so that the world can be prepared. You can do what you want with that. So the world can be prepared for an end time thing, an end time move. You know, maybe you might say, yeah, but... That's what I was like, driving down the road. Yeah, but he's not sorry. <laughs> and you know what the Lord said? How dare you? How dare you call unclean what my blood has made clean? How do, you don't even know what's in your heart, son. Anyway, that's another story for another time. So let's keep reading. Oh, let me keep going. So William J. Seymour gets on his mule, his donkey, his horse, whatever he does, and he goes to Houston, Texas. He hears Parham pre teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he, does, he all he knows is, that's right. That feels right. That sounds right. Oh, that's good. But he didn't get filled with the Holy Spirit. So he takes that message with him as he goes to L.A. And he goes into the church, and what's the first thing that brother preaches? He ain't even filled with the Holy Spirit. He starts preaching the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He starts preaching the message of Pentecost. And what happens? Uh, the people get stirred and, and whatever. So he, let's come back Sunday night, and we're going to pick it up. He comes back Sunday night. Guess what happened? The doors were chained shut. He was no longer welcome with his message about 
tongues and fire and Pentecost and Holy Ghost. So, uh, but some lady said, brother, that message that you preached stirred my heart. I got a place. My house is right over here on Azusa Street in Los Angeles. Come over here and let's have a Bible study. I feel the Holy Spirit all over this, my friend, because look, I think they were spilling out of the doors, out of the windows. The yards were full, and this thing took the whole world by storm. And listen, people were getting filled People were getting saved, and all that is the story of what happened. Now, the enemy will always come in and try to counterfeit something. We don't have time to get into that. Let's keep going. So they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Tongues of fire fell upon them. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered. Because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya. Look, there's at least three continents represented here. Uh, Cyrene and Rome, Europe, uh, Asia, Okay, and Africa, three continents, all in one location. There's something to this. There's something to this. People from different continents, different nations, different tongues, speaking in tongues, but yet now everybody hears what's going on. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. I wanted to say that whenever I look at those two pieces of bread and I look at the final completed product, again, I can't prove this. I'm preaching this typologically. These two loaves of bread in my mind represent both Israel and Christian. What are you talking about? Because, see, I'm talking about the harvest. I'm talking about the completed work of the harvest where it goes from grain to two loaves of bread. There's so much typology in bread communion with the Lord, communion between him and his body. So many different things. That, But God is working on this earth to save both Jew and Gentile. I, I, I put back in my head, I put Gentile up there, but I said, no, I'm going to put Christian. Because every Gen, you know what a Gentile is? It's a person from another nation other than Israel. But there's a whole lot of Gentiles still out there that ain't saved. But once they, that Gentile gets saved, they're going to be Christian. And now they're part of the people of God. And it's part of the plan of God. And the loaves of bread represent communion, but they also represent a completed work of the harvest. Now, I want to give you some New Testament scripture that talks about that. All right? Let's look at this. Ephesians 2.14. This is what Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. you got to go back and read the context, but let me just tell you what he's talking about. Jew and Gentile. He took away the division, and he made us one in Christ. He is broken down in his flesh. That's talking about the cross. Jesus, through his death on the cross, removed the separation line between Jew and Gentile, and he's made all one. But in the Old Testament, it was still two. That's why there was two loaves of bread. God had a plan. I believe that. And, and in his flesh, he took down the dividing wall of hostility. But look, this is another harvest message because I want you to see Pentecost is all about harvest. Yes, in the Old Testament, it was about agriculture. It was about the production of these two loaves of bread and worshiping God with these two loaves of bread. But in the New Testament, it's about the harvest of souls, amen, and the need for the Holy Spirit in order to work with God to accomplish his will. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I want you to see that. <laughs> I've used a lot of words already. I'm about to close. But I want you to see that. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into the field. Are you a laborer for God? Am I a laborer for God? All of our labor is not going to look the same, my friend. But let me tell you this. If you drove down the road right there and you stopped at Stasio and to put some gas in your truck and you saw an old person from your past 
and they looked downcast. Remember how we were talking about people's faces a couple of weeks ago? And they looked downcast because they were sad or they were a little too busy. And you said, you just said a little something. Hey, man, what's been happening? You doing okay? Oh, no, I'm not really. Per- Dude, you just did it. You just got your open door. You just, all you did was you saw the face. Hey, man, how you been doing? You took a second of your busy schedule. Come on, don't let me get, I don't want to get in the flesh and start aggravating people. You took a second of your busy schedule and you said, how you been doing, man? And then that person in response, because the Lord wanted him to respond that way, because the Lord wanted the door open, because the Lord wanted a word of the seed of the gospel planted in his heart, because the Lord wants his soul saved. He said, man, I ain't really been doing too good. I've been going through some stuff. What's, what's been going on? Oh, another second right there. You took that. What's been going on? Man, you know, I'm going through this. I'm going through that. Well, you know what, dude? And you give him a word. You know, I, I, I understand what you're saying, man. Life, life is rough, but I just know that the Lord did a work in my heart, man. I just want you to know that there's hope, you know. And look, you still got my number? Text me. You know, you want me to text you? You know, something like that. I just want you, and you just send him a scripture. I don't know how it's going to play out. I'm just telling you. You just functioned And you were a laborer in the harvest. That might not seem like a big deal to you, but I'm telling you right now, it's a lot bigger deal than you just saying, oh, there he is again. Look at his little sad, sourpuss-looking face. Let me just fill my truck up and let me keep on moving. You see the difference between the two? Oh, there they are, walking down Walmart's aisle. Lord, let me duck over here because the Lord knows I want to get all up in that. Right? That's the difference because, see, when the Holy Spirit comes to roost in your heart, you ain't living your life for yourself no more, my friend. I'm not living my life for myself no more. I'm living for Jesus by his grace, by his strength. Give me more of the Holy Spirit so I'll start looking more like Jesus. Amen? I think that's good right there. That's the Holy Ghost. I mean, that's the message of Jesus Christ. All right, here we go. I want you, now listen, I want you to notice something right here that, I, that I've been noticing for a while, but I think that this is the clearest I'll ever say it. Babel. I want you to think about Babel. Now, I don't want you to think too much because this is way deep. And if you come to the class that we're having with this book, sooner or later we're going to get into Babel. <laughs> but I want to remind you what happened at Babel. What happened? What's the main thing that happened at Babel? God confused their languages. God confused the tongues at Babel, right? Now, when we begin to study in detail the things that were going on at Babel, what we will begin to realize, I'm telling you right now, you just got to trust me in this, that was the devil's attempt to cause man to move away from God and to create a new world order. Let's just call it like that. Let's just make it and use words that you and I can, can agree to. They were worshiping false gods. They were hearing communication from false gods, and they were in direct disobedience to God. How you know? Because God told Noah's offspring to remultiply over the face of the earth, and under the leadership of Nimrod, and listen, there's so much extra, extra biblical information out there. This is where astrology comes from. This is where mystery Babylon comes from. All of these things. So they're worshiping false gods, and God says, I'm going to confuse their tongues. Because we ain't letting the devil create his own kingdom. Definitely not in this point in human history. So the tongues are now confused. Confusion, division of the people, and forcing them to do what he told them to do to begin with because he wanted human beings all over the face of the earth. How you know that, preacher? Because in Revelation chapter 5, when they're all dressed in white robes and they have palms in their hand, they say, glory to the Lamb, for you have redeemed us with your blood out of every tongue and tribe and nation. It was always God's plan for there to be a family from all different parts of the earth, but man in his rebellion against God through the rebellion of the enemy instead disobeys God so what does God do he confuses the tongues then on the day of Pentecost Jesus comes hallelujah on the day on on Pentecost what happens he gives them the tongues but what's even more interesting is if we back up a chapter what did Jesus say he said, you will tarry for me in Jerusalem. You will be endued or you will be given power from on high. And when you get the power, what are you going to do? You're going to be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the outermost parts of the earth. And in this situation, whereas in the past the tongues were divided and people could not understand themselves, when the Holy Spirit falls and the church begins and they begin to speak in other tongues, what happens? 
I hear them in my own language. What I'm trying to tell you is this is bigger than just people walking around and speaking in tongues. This has to do with the Great Commission. This has to do with telling the world about Jesus. This, this, we hear them in our own tongue speak of the mighty works of God. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that you can be empowered to do the will and the work of God. Amen. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. I'm closing with this particular scripture. So those who received his word were baptized. This is after Peter preaches his message. I didn't, we weren't going to go through the whole message. It's a beautiful message he preached. Those who received his word were baptized. There were added that day about 3,000 souls. Amen.